All right, uh, good morning. Uh, exciting to be here. I uh, really enjoyed the talks from yesterday and hoping to maybe integrate them in the work that I'm doing. I'm um, excited to talk about what I've been working on and um, hopefully point out some opportunities for uh, both analysis and some experimentation. <coughs> So I'm going to talk about is kind of a paradigm or framework that I've been developing with Carson Chow over the NIH. Um, in order to, uh, I started on this specifically trying to come up with some objective uh, approach for uh, clinical psychiatry for mental illness studies. So I'd like to start off with uh, kind of a big picture, um, big picture case, which is you know some of the major challenges we're coming up with an objective approach for psychiatry. And so, of course, the, the big one that's always been an issue for psychiatry since its inception is figuring out what the state space is, right? Um, so how do we characterize clinical cases in some objective way and hopefully, um, of course, have them biologically grounded? And as, as many of you know, um, the big challenge of biological, mo uh, biological modeling of this is that we're dealing with um, huge differences in scale. So, let's see the pointer. There we go. And so just to illustrate this, um, you know, things that were interested in clinically are at this very high level in terms of social language as function, um, perceptual abnormalities such as delusions, hallucinations. Uh, and so this is what we're interested in, but we know from classic pedigree studies, um, and more recently with GWAS, of course with uh, therapeutics, that you know, they have their grounding in a molecular basis so at the cellular level. And so somehow these abnormalities, these perturbations are percolating all the way up <coughs> to this macroscopic level. So this is somewhat, of course, a huge, very daunting problem, possibly intractable. And so how do we actually get some traction on this? And what I'd say is that, you know, what we want to be able to do is identify kind of what are the key nonlinearities um, that will help us try to figure out um, how to deal with those problems. And so the approach that I've taken is focusing on modeling psychophysics and the electrophysiology that's associated with it. And I think that this is very useful um, in actually giving us at least some um, ability to model these complex systems. So I actually want to give a little bit of my background uh, just to give you an idea why I started on this, where, where I was coming from. So I actually started uh, as a medical student I was finishing up my rotations, um, and I was interested in child psychiatry. And I was really fortunate in order to do some special rotations through NIMH. So I was over at uh, Judy Rappaport's lab, um, which is a great uh, child psychiatry schizophrenia uh, group. And I also um, was fortunate to rotate through Kennedy Krieger Institute, um, which is historically a great um, both treatment and research institute that specializes in things like autism, ADHD, cerebral palsy. And during that time, back in 2007, uh, particularly, particularly Judy Rappaport, she was working uh, with a group, with you know, a number of people on the DSM-5. And so I was hearing a lot about the issues that they were having with um, trying to come up with a new nosology that was biologically grounded. And uh, there was a lot, of, you know, a lot of issues with that. As many of you know, the director of time, Thomas Insull, also published a lot of things about um, uh, these issues with DSM. <laughs> so we're looking for possibly a new, new way of classifying disease. And again, it comes back to the state space. In addition to that, when I was at Kennedy Krieger, um, you know, there's a lot of cognitive tests that were being uh, tried out, um, various fMRI studies, things of that sort. And there are things like um, a lot of ideas floating around, like particularly in autism, like executive dysfunction. So in autism, having these abnormalities in planning, working memory, things of that sort. Um, ideas of weak central coherence. And there's some various kind of word theories, things like under connectivity of the brain, excitation and imbalance. There's a, a big researcher in the field, Manuel Casanova, um, he was doing things like, uh, talking about things like mini column abnormalities. Uh, and so this is, you know, looking at postmortem tissue and autism brains and seeing that there's these histological differences and trying to explain um, autism features on that. Channel, channelopathies, so this came from protein expression studies showing that there's abnormalities in the expression levels, the certain GABA channels. Uh, Daniel Geshwin was doing some genetic um, studies as well, showing abnormalities in GABA, things of that sort. And it was influenced by some of the psychophysics work um, that Nancy Michu was doing and a number of important other people, as an off with Casanova again. And I happened to be uh, working with a, a great clinician over at KKI, Andrew Zimmerman, 
who's actually working at Casanova in order to try to figure out how this mini calm or whatnot, um, how it can manifest in autism symptoms. So that's where I started from. And I was really wanting to make this concrete. So we had all these ideas, I wanted to make it concrete. So I ended up partnering with uh, Carson Chow. Uh, so I discovered him, so I was lucky, I was fortunate that he was actually in the area. And so he's, um, he had done some great work in modeling uh, neurophysiologic models of psychophysics. And so uh, we got together, we were talking, and the first thing that we did was we used a very popular model of working memory at the time. So this was about 2000, I think. Um, and so this is a model of, um, a lot of you know, uh, Kahn, Brunel, Golden Rakesh, Shaoxing Wang. Um, so we took this model and we um, inserted some of these uh, abnormalities, um, so these channel differences, um, trying to model these mini column abnormalities. And we showed that, you know, you can explain the psychophysical differences um, that, that Nancy Michu was seeing in her experiments. So that, that's where it kind of started. Um, the thing about this was it wasn't very happy with this model. Um, it, it had some biological basis, but it had you know, pretty high degrees of freedom. It didn't seem like it was very well constrained. And, um, and it's, it's kind of getting to the scalability issue. Is I wanted to get at what, what is the kind of the abstract, what's the key thing um, about these models they want to take away? How can we identify them? And so I ended up pivoting to rivalry modeling, and that's what I'm going to talk about a lot about today. And um, the reason for this, so one, Carson actually had a lot of expertise, expertise in rivalry, so that was, that was good. <laughs> and as I can explain, um, there's a lot of interesting things in perceptual rivalry that I think really help us to um, constrain the model space. And in doing this, an important theme throughout the entire work is that we're using kind of a general, we actually call a canonical circuit. Um, I call it a framework mainly because there's actually a number of models that all have certain common features um, that you can derive from this um, that are able to explain a large number of cognitive traits. Okay, so now I'm gonna spend a little time, quite a bit of time actually talking about Banakarabi just, just as kind of a special thing. Um, and then I'll get into, uh, talk about some other examples as well. So why do we like rivalry? Okay, so first of all, what is perceptual rivalry? So perceptual rivalry is this phenomena um, we have alterations or uh, differences in your, in your interpretation of an object um, that are independent of the stimulus. Okay, so that's kind of a crude definition of it. Uh, many of you may have seen this before, so I just want you to appreciate it if you haven't before. So look at this 2D drawing. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's really hard to see the 2D representation, right? You end up seeing a 3D projection. And as you keep watching it, you'll see that the orientation of this cube changes over time. So that's profound. I mean, this is, so stimulus is a very simple, you know, image. Um, everything is happening is, is happening in your brain, right? So the thing about rivalry is that pretty much, it's, it's a pretty ubiquitous phenomenon. It's found in, uh, it's been noted in pretty much all sensory modalities. So this is uh, auditory streaming. So if I give you um, some kind of tonal pattern, you know, the parsing it different, uh, differently over time. If you end up listening to a word repeated over and over again, you'll actually um, end up hearing different phonemes. Uh, there's even olfactory versions, tactile, motion, and then there's binocular rivalry. <coughs> so binocular rivalry has been known for many centuries, um, but it's probably Wheatstone when he created a stereoscope that really brought it into um, an experimental modality, uh, made it feasible for experiments. And so um, what's the stereoscope? So what he, he uh, rigged up was this set of mirrors and these images and he showed, said, okay, well, show each eye an uh, image with a certain angle of disparity, you can get this stereoscopic or 3D illusion. Well, he also noted that if you showed very different images to each of the eyes, rather than getting kind of a stable fused construct, you end up getting these alternations in perception. So for modeling rivalry, um, what was really important is a set of propositions that Lavelle came up with. So it's a set of four propositions. And what this is, it's a, um, uh, what he's, he's describing are some very stereotypical response functions. And um, when you change some of the attributes of the stimuli, um, particularly contrast. So you go high, high to low, low, or you do this asymmetric. And I explain why this is important for modeling. So what are these problems? There's four propositions. So the fourth proposition is this, is that if you increase the contrast, 
you end up decreasing um, the stability of the percept. And uh, just a note here, one could imagine that it could have increased, it could have had some other weird nonlinear function, but you get this very robust decrease. In addition, if you do an asymmetric chain, so you, you keep the contrast the same, and then you lower one of the uh, contrast on one of the images, well, unlike Lavelle's fourth, where you know, maybe you'd expect that this image should actually become more stable, there's actually really no effect on it, and there's a huge effect on the other um, percept. This is a very robust finding. So 30 years later, Leopold and Logothetis show it in monkeys and in humans. And so immediately you're thinking, okay, there's some, there's some kind of negative coupling between these. Um, and maybe there, you know, come up some uh, some model, but this was a huge challenge for modeling actually um, in the field for many decades. So uh, in the 60s, when they, they described this, it took until about 2002 with Lang and Chow uh, really to explain how this is happening. And I'll get into kind of why this was a challenge a little bit uh, in a second. But what Lang and Chow did was they said, let me take this general um, cerebral cortical circuit, which I'm going to describe in a second. And they show that it just naturally explains these phenomena. And I do have to give um, credit and point out that Grossberg actually noted this um, to some degree in 93 as well. And it was in a thesis by Arrington. So Grossberg's done you know, a lot of work that I think we don't necessarily always recognize. OK. So what's the model? So the model is really simple. So it starts off with this idea. And so you, you know, a lot of you are familiar with this, is that we have this, these pools of neurons. Okay. So, um, you know, a lot of li early electrophysiology work says uh, to have a monkey presented with an image, and you find these populations of neurons that tend to have elevated firing for that image. Okay, so we group these guys together, and we call this a pool, and then we have some scaling. So, um, importantly, Wilson Cowan in, in the 70s uh, made an, uh, kind of an onsets and approximation and said, well, you know, I need something that's a little more theoretical or analytically tractable. So what we're going to do is we're just going to assume that these are somewhat randomly connected. And we're going to say we're going to re-represent them by single populations that kind of take on the average attributes of their constituent neurons. <coughs> and so you have this um, pretty stereotypical Wilson-Cowan type network um, that a lot of us use for modeling. Uh, in addition to that, we can collapse it a little bit further um, and actually come up with a hybrid neuron which has excitatory and inhibitory projections. Um, and as you're doing the scaling, of course, you're, you're losing dynamics. So that's important. Um, but it depends on what we're trying to fit. And what I'm going to say is a lot of stuff that I'm fitting, um, actually, this is kind of the minimal model. Uh, if we want to um, do some of the important stuff that uh, Nancy Capel does, um, you need to have this kind of um, two-pool two -pool system. And in fact, a lot of the modeling that I do kind of goes back and forth between these levels of description. OK. So furthermore, in, this, uh, in setting up the network um, in rivalry, this is particularly important, the work by Leopold and Logothetis in the 90s. So what they did was they recorded neurons. Um, so what they did was they identified these pools using these non-competitive stimuli. And they said, OK, now let's record from those pools, and let's, let's expose the monkey, have them do this rivalry task. So they found that there was a subset of these neurons. So what we're looking at is um, the subset of neurons are like this image A, which is coded, color coded uh, by red. And so they're recording from that and showing that you get elevated activity in some population of that um, that's coincident with um, when the monkey is reporting. And importantly, this is actually anticipating the motor response as well. It's not just when they're reporting, it's actually a little bit anticipating it. And also importantly for binocular rivalry, um, a lot of people might think, oh, okay, maybe this is some kind of eye competition that's going on. Well, what they showed was actually a lot of the neurons are doing this. Um, they're correlated with perception or in higher levels of processing and uh, that, are I, um, that, that aren't specific for I, uh, particular I. And so this idea of having percept or um, these pools that are correlated with perception, um, it's also consistent with kind of delay period activity experiments, um, Funahashi, Golan, Rikish, and Colby. OK. So, um, and so finally, what we can imagine then is that we have some feed-forward uh, processing of information uh, that's going to be correlated with more of the stimulus. But then we're going to have these independent, um, at some point there's some break in the system, and you end up getting this other class of pools um, that are more correlated with perception. And what I'm showing here is mutual inhibition. Uh, this is usually the way we think about mutual inhibition, is that long-range excitation to kind of local inhibitory neurons. 
Um, really believe there's kind of a continuum of ways that you can, you can have this. You, you know, usually you can always find some electrophysiology experiment um, that, that shows different types of wiring. Um, but, you know, when we talk about two-layer system, this is kind of what we think about. The important thing I want to point out here is that, you know, some people use this model to say things about excitation, inhibition, and balance and try to, to model that. But these are highly recurrent uh, systems, and so it's really hard to, to say, you know, what an inhibitory versus an excitatory effect is going to be. And so there's usually some effective uh, thing that we have to go after. So just really, I'm just pointing out here, for example, you're having this mutual inhibition, but it's enacted by excitation. Okay, this is kind of a tangent. So in addition to the neural network um, kind of cartoon, the schematic, we can model the dynamics of the neuron in, at various scales as well. So this is actually originally what Lang and Chow use. They use a Hodgkin-Huxley type neuron. Um, and so you can have, you know, uh, some channel kinetics in here, um, some, you know, detailed kinetics if you want, and uh, this thing will produce action potentials. Um, importantly, in order for the model to work for rivalry, uh, we have to add, they have to add a uh, fatigue variable. So this is just one example. This is um, calcium, uh, a calcium activated potassium channel. And the reason why um, you need to have this is that uh, one could imagine that in rivalry, what you have is maybe just some escape from a well. So you have a two well system is just kind of popping out. out. Um, the issue with that model is that you'd end up getting an exponential distribution of um, percept durations, but instead you get this gamma-like distribution, suggesting that there's some kind of refractory um, or kind of slow process. Um, and so that's why you end up having this. That's probably the best defense for having this, this fatigue variable. I'm going to show some other defenses for that as well. However, you know, as I said, you know, we want to we want to get the salient features of these systems in our model. So this has a lot of detail. There's a lot of extraneous detail actually um, that the rivalry model is not really constrained for. And so what we end up doing is we end up explicitly taking what's called the FI curve. So I think a lot of most of you know what this is. Um, and so this is kind of the effective um, response of the neurons uh, to various strengths of input. And so rather than so the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron uh, effectively produces this. And then what we do is we just explicitly model that. And so that's this function g of x. Um, and like I said, uh, we can model at various levels of network kind of designs. And so we can also do this kind of explicit uh, mutual inhibition type model. OK. So that's, that's just kind of talking about different scales that we can model at. And so Lang and Chow, so what they showed is they take this Hodgkin-Huxley model, OK, where you get alternations in rivalry. That's not enough for a rivalry model, by the way. So some people only take it that far. Um, actually getting Lavelts, being able to show that is um, important as well. And so it naturally gets this phenomena. In order to understand why this is, uh, why it's able to do this, we have to look at the reduced system. So this is a reduced system. And so you have this effective, so like I said, we end up having these gain functions. So what happens is you get this winner take all kind of behavior where one of the populations is super threshold. It puts in some mutual inhibition on the other population, makes it sub-threshold. Then you have some slow fatigue process resulting in a switch. How that switch happens is um, important in figuring out why Lavelts, why we actually observe Lavelts propositions. Okay, so I said that for mutual inhibition, um, there's a lot of uh, debate about mutual inhibition models. And in part is because a lot of people are thinking about this release mechanism. So, in a release mechanism, so usually the idea is that, okay, one of the, some, some percept is active, and you're waiting for it to be um, either displaced due to maybe some large perturbation or due to fatigue building up. And that doesn't actually give you Lavelle. So it will give you very different um, behaviors. I'm going to show that in a second. The thing about rivalry is that it's a sustained phenomena. So you're looking at it, and it's actually going through bouts of switching. And so what that means is that the, the suppressed population actually has a fatigue variable that it's recovering from. And this is decaying, and as it decays, the input, the drive to this, um, this down population is reaching threshold. And so it can do something that's called escape. And that can happen before the release mechanism. And that, that actually explains why you get Lavelle. So I'm going to point out here that the shape of this gain function actually helps determine which of these mechanisms dominates. Yeah. Can 
Uh, why it has to be? Yeah, because yeah. couldn't you just as easily have the fatigue on the dominant percept? And if you got the same time courses on the fatigue, wouldn't it, wouldn't it give you the same result? No, so I'm going to explain that in a second. Um, actually, next slide. Okay. What I'm showing here, there are two ways that you can possibly have a switch. Make sure that, I want to make sure that's clear. So this is the one where you have the fatigue is on the dominant population. It's building up. And so while that's building up, this is approaching threshold. It's going down. Okay. The other mechanism you can have is that, and this is the one that people neglected, was that you actually have fatigue from the last time you're uh, on. And that's decaying away, and so it's actually rising towards threshold. And so you have these two possible mechanisms. This is the one that actually explains the belts. Okay. So as I said, I'm going to claim that this is what ex uh, explains Lavelle's. And the reason for this is, so let's look at Lavelle's second proposition. So in Lavelle's second proposition, um, what's happening here is that you're changing the contrast to only this gray population, OK? But the main effect is on the other population in which you didn't, you didn't alter. And the reason why this is in showing an escape mechanism is because as you decrease this contrast, that's the S in this, this equation. Um, you're changing the distance from threshold for that, for that suppressed population. So as you make the drive lower for that gray population, it's taking longer for it to reach escape. And as it takes longer to reach escape, it allows the dominant population to stay on for a longer period of time. Okay? If it was a release mechanism as you well, for one, if it was a release mechanism, as you change this gray population, you wouldn't get any effect. You'd have to change the drive to the on population. The fact that you change it to the down population is already telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you separate out, sorry, can, can you separate out whether the dominant population, can you separate out whether it's a change in the length of the time of the dominant population or versus the short population getting smaller? Are you looking at averages over many trials? Or are you looking at the times within each case? So this is a deterministic model. So this is just, yeah, there's just one. Well, but I mean yeah. the data. This, oh, sorry, this is a simulation. Yeah. No, no, I know. Yeah, yeah. In the data... Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. In the data, yeah. Is it simply the proportion of time, at which point you could either be shrinking one or... Gotcha. The other? Yeah, yeah, no, this, this, is, um, this is actually the dominance period. It's not the proportion that you're dominant within a block, right? That's what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so uh, the data that we're looking at is the actual durations in seconds. Okay, not, not the relative duration. Okay, so I got, I, I'm gonna try to actually go through a lot of the modeling. <laughs> um, there's a lot that I wanna actually cover. Um, and this is just the early, kind of the early work. Um, and there's, there's a lot of uh, great papers talking about this. Uh, and so for Lovell's fourth, um, the reason why you get this is because now you're changing the drive to both of the suppressed populations, so then you consistently get this monotonically decreasing function. Okay, so, the model naturally captures this, um, and that's, that's history. So this is stuff that was understood and discovered uh, before I actually started dealing with the system. Um, and so I just want to point out some of the other things about this. So this is a general model, um, and the model I just described is just, this is just one variant of how you can do this. There's actually a whole class of models. Um, other forms would have things like um, synaptic depression. So in this model I have, um, I was showing has local fatigue but you can also have fatigue on the um, coupling between these populations. Uh, it will give you similar dynamics. Um, people also have done more complex things, so um, there, there can be eye effects, or actually invariance eye effects. And in order to explain that, uh, you'll have some kind of hierarchical model that actually um, explicitly models the eyes as well. Uh, things like object disparity, so um, how different the objects are will also change the degree of dominance that you'll get. Uh, and there's various other, there's, there's traveling wave variants, but at the heart of them all is this very simple kind of network. <clears throat> now this model, as I mentioned, uh, was that, it's actually been used for lots of applications. It's kind of the basic model for winner take all or decision making as well, this, this mutual inhibition with a threshold. Um, 
And the other nice thing about it is that it explains actually a lot of uh, what I call cryptic or covert electrophysiology. Um, normalization, I'm not going to talk about that, but this is, this is an example from Flanker Suppressor Task. So here you're recording from a neuron that likes this kind of black image here. And so um, when you turn that on, you get this spike of activity, kind of goes down a little bit, quite a bit. And then you show the suppressor, and you end up getting this 5 hertz decaying oscillation. So this is data. And so you're able to show that you can actually get this in the model as well. And now the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually kind of the work that I've, I actually contribute to uh, mostly, which is short-term memory modeling. So I kind of, uh, the model that was used for rivalry, actually pre previous to that, Carson and many others actually used that to model short-term memory and specifically this delay period activity. Um, and that's actually kind of where it started. And then they, they said, okay, well, if you add fatigue, maybe we can explain rivalry as well. And so um, I ended up revisiting this memory modeling. And the reason for this is because I was actually trying to come up with an experimental paradigm um, to test on autistic uh, individuals with autism. Uh, so I was trying to come up with a rivalry paradigm. And the one that I chose was actually kind of a little bit different from the static rivalry. And it um, ended up tapping into this short-term memory phenomena that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I needed to model it to figure out um, how to actually run this experiment. And in doing so, I, I, I learned some stuff about short-term memory. So, so first of all, this is kind of the classic uh, thing that a lot of people tried to model uh, a long time ago. Um, so this is a ocular motor uh, delayed response task. So what happens is uh, the, the monkey fixates. The target appears, you're not allowed to look at it until the queue, until the fixation queue disappears, and then you look at it. So if you record from PFC or lateral and parietal uh, LIP areas, we end up seeing, um, in some cases, is this elevated delay period activity that's tuned to, to the target, okay? So a lot of people have shown this. However, um, there's been a lot of debate about this delay period activity. And so, um, for example, Miller in the review has shown that if you have a very trained kind of situation, that this delay period activity is actually very close to baseline. Uh, Shafi and others show that, again, this delay period activity can be very close to baseline, as those could be highly variable. And this is spatial memory. Uh, if you look at object memory as well, you can get this delay period activity that's really, again, close to baseline. So I'm just going to talk about those two. So those are two things I'm going to try to capture in the model. But importantly, I'm trying to capture these things, which are kind of really interesting about rivalry. So rivalry has memory. So what's the how, do, how do we know this? So if we take binocular rivalry and we show it, you get alternations in perception. Then you turn it off. Then you turn it back on. It turns out that the most likely perceptor you're going to perceive was the last one that, that was on. So this is profound for a number of reasons. So the first one is that this is an experiment that doesn't require the subject to memorize anything. So it's just a natural memory that, that's being, you know, that we're discovering from the system. Um, the other thing, too, is that rivalry has a fatigue variable. It's long time variable as a fatigue variable. So if anything, what you'd imagine is that when it comes back on, you should get anti-memory. It should actually switch. But phenomenologically, that's not what happens. And this has been known for many decades, but um, perhaps it was Leopold's experiment that really showed how robust this was for rivalry across many different domains. So this is a motion version, this is a binocular rivalry, necker cube, et cetera. And so this is the normal transition rate histogram. And when you introduce these delays, it, they massively slow down. OK, so that's one, one interesting thing. There's more interesting things. So the other thing, <laughs> which you probably, if you ask anybody on the street about memory, is that the longer the delay, the more likely you should forget, right? Uh, that's not what happens, happens in rivalry. It actually is more robust. So this is just a null. And compared to the null, what we're looking at is as we increase the blank duration, the reversal rate is decreasing. So it's becoming more stable. So we need to be able to explain that. OK. And so this is actually what I was working on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the quartet. This actually adds even more constraints. OK. <laughs> so hopefully I don't give anyone a seizure here. But, um, so I just want you to watch this for a little while. And so some of you are going to see uh, back and forth motion. Some of you are going to see up and down motion. One great thing about doing rivalry talks is that you get to show illusions. Um, and I want you to raise your hand if you see a change in the motion. 
do. Okay, excellent. Okay, some of you might not see it. It, it takes sometimes quite a long time. Actually, that's the thing that we're trying to, we, we just try to model. Okay, so what's happening in the quartet? So quartet is actually alternating between these still frames, okay? And in fact, what you're seeing are blinking dots. I mean, that's, oh, sorry, what's being presented are blinking dots, but the motion overrides that. So there's two types of illusions. So one of them is that you, you get something called apparent motion. And the other um, illusionary phenomena or perceptual phenomena is that you have rivalry, so it, it switches direction, okay? And we were doing these experiments because this, we thought that this would be kind of easier to report than binocular rivalry. If you do binocular rivalry, there's some, it's a little bit hard to report on. Um, but what we discovered was that we ended up getting this, it seems to be this memory effect. So as you change the frame rate, and here what I'm showing is um, how long the still frames are on for, uh, you end up getting this nonlinear increase in the percept duration. And what this is actually telling us is that in, uh, so Leopold actually ran those experiments also with the quartet, but what he did was he introduced a third frame which was a blank. So he showed the quartet, it's on, it's switching, and then he put in a blank, and then uh, he showed that stabilized the percept. Well, it turns out for the quartet, it actually naturally is kind of a memory phenomenon. Um, and what's happening is that the, the, the salient, the important input is actually the switch between the frames. And while the frames are stable, static, that's actually kind of more like a blank period. And so that's consistent, you know, that, that gives us a, uh, that makes this picture consistent with the memory experiments. Okay. And so we wanted to be able to model that. The other thing about the quartet, the reason why I'm introducing this is because it actually has an additional phenomena which are accelerations, we call it habituation. But if we fix that frame period and you're just observing, you're reporting on one of these movies, um, the percept durations will actually accelerate, they'll, they'll uh, become less stable over time. And I was able to easy, easily corroborate this because I was talking to other experimentalists and this is a nuisance for people who are, who are trying to actually do experiments with the quartet. They actually don't like this, it's kind of an annoying thing, but it's a feature for us for modeling. Um, and we ran those experiments on a number of naive subjects and we were able to, to show that's a robust phenomena. Okay, so in order to get into the modeling, um, so th th these are our constraints. So what I want is I want a model that can do delay period activity, but it's variable, it's a variable amplitude. Uh, the other thing I want is a model that can show increased percept stability with increased delays, and also have this, what I call the, we call it habituation in paper, but kind of an acceleration, okay? And like I said, the standard rivalry model, it's a little bit of a straw man here, is that, that if, you, if you implement it, it actually gives you the anti-memory, which is you expect, okay? So a lot of people thought that the standard model doesn't have memory, in fact, it would have anti-memory. In fact, Carson actually published a paper, and in it, he also, well, the student who was the first author on it, um, pointed out that, that rivalry needed to be augmented in order to get this memory. Okay, so what are the solutions? So, so again, I'm after a canonical circuit. I'm after a general circuit. And so I don't want to add a lot of things if I don't need to. Um, and so do we need to add anything is, is, is the question. So I kind of lied in a way. I said that the rivalry model is kind of the same as a short-term memory model. It isn't. Um, there's a parameter that we drop out when we model rivalry, and that's recurrent excitation. And so, you know, the standard rivalry model, you know, you have some solid node, bifurcation that gives you this multi-stability. So you end up bending back the gain, the gain function. We avoid this in rivalry, a lot of, um, not just us, but a lot of modelers uh, um, historically avoided this because you can get something called, what, what has been called rhythmogenesis. So rivalry itself is an alternation of perception, but what can happen is that you can also have oscillations in the dominant population. So you can get period doubling, you can get um, some weird statistics that haven't been observed empirically, I will caveat that and say that I don't think anyone's actually deeply looked to see if those statistics e exist or not. But in general, it was avoided. So you can put in recurrent excitation, but then there's some fine tuning that you need to do. Um, and all of these I'm gonna say are plausible. So I'm not dismissing any of them. Um, the question is, do we actually need to do this? Another thing is that we can add a facilitation current instead. So actually in short-term memory modeling, rather than having um, this kind of viability during recurrent excitation, a number of people um, will actually model it as a subthreshold calcium current. And 
that's fine too as a model for memory. Um, the only issue is just that you, you may end up running into more complications because now you're competing against this fatigue variable. And so again, you run into how do you tune the parameters. And in a way, we accidentally discovered another form of memory. Um, we call this topological memory. And it turns out the standard rivalry model actually can have memory. It, it's an implementation issue. So the way that uh, people have historically modeled or ran, uh, implemented the model, um, it, it, it has this anti-memory. But it turns out that if you have mutual inhibition and a threshold concave activation function, so I mentioned the, the activation, the shape of that's important for getting Lavelts. Um, it's also important for getting this robust kind of memory. Um, and so these are various ways that people have modeled the, the gain function. So this is a threshold um, linear, piecewise linear function. This is actually not good. Um, it doesn't explain Lavelts propositions, even though it's, you know, it gives us some analytical tractability. Another one that's very popular is use a sigmoid function or its, its extreme version is a heavy side. Um, and this will actually compete, start giving you things that are not Lavelts. Um, and it also is not great for memory. Uh, this memory max is I'm going to talk about. This one is, is pretty good. These are sufficient conditions. I'm not going to claim any necessary conditions. <laughs> but, um, but this works. And so, and there's another additional thing that we need to add that I was saying that, that often gets neglected. So, and that's that these neuronal systems aren't quiet. They're not, they're not getting, there's no absence of input during the off period. They're always getting some kind of input. And so if we take that into account, uh, we're able to actually uh, get this memory. So what it is is that you, you turn the system on and so you have stimulus on, and it always has a little bit of background input as well. And the background input's enough in order to maintain um, the asymmetry in the dominant state. And so when you turn it back on, you're, just, you're basically shrinking and expanding, shrinking, expanding, shrinking, expanding um, in order to get this. Okay, so the other thing too is if you don't like running the system. So what you're doing is during the off period, you're saying, okay, well, there's, there's a little bit of an on for some kind of constant that we're going to add to, to, the, to the, the equations. But if you don't like that, um, it turns out that zero mean noise is sufficient to, run, to, to capture this memory. Um, and that's because the, the neuron is a rectifying function. So it can take the zero mean noise and it turns into a positive input. In a little bit, it's, it's kind, of, um, kind of how the balance state, which I'm going to talk about, um, how it works as well. Um, and so that zero mean noise, so th this is another interesting attribute is that noise is actually stabilizing the memory. Okay, so topologically, so why do we call this topological memory? The reason is, is that this is one kind of common bifurcation diagram for the system. You get this pitchfork bifurcation. So what we're looking at is U1 being greater than U2, so that means that's dom U1's dominant or U2's dominant. So you have this parity. And when the system's on, you get one of the two um, asymmetries, and then when it's off, because of the concave function, you can actually prove that you can be arbitrarily close to zero and maintain this asymmetry. Okay, not only that, uh, but the system's various versions of the model all give you this increase in stability um, as you increase the duration. So I'm gonna quickly summarize uh, why this happens. So in the system, what you're doing is you're competing, you have this U fixed point is competing with the fatigue variable. Okay, so that, that really gives us a lot of the dynamics. And so the reason why the memory becomes more stable with bigger breaks is because you're not letting the fatigue variable build up. The fatigue variable is a function of the activity, and so you're kind of pausing it if you bring it to a very low level. And one of the arguments about the short-term memory modeling with persistent activity is that that baseline or being near baseline is bad for memory. This is actually an argument against that. It's actually saying that being close to baseline is actually reducing fatigue, and um, that's actually helping stabilize the system. Uh, what else? And so that's the reason why the bigger delays, you get a, you get a bigger, uh, this nonlinear increase in the stability. Um, ah. This is really important for us. We didn't know this until we did the modeling. We were already running pilot experiments and we dis when we discovered the mechanism for this, we realized that one of our parameters dropped out. Um, because what's happening in this is different from sustained rivalry. This is actually a release mechanism. So what's happening is, um, 
you get this buildup fatigue, and the next time that you're on, you're fighting the activity variable is fighting the, the fatigue variable. And if the fatigue variable is too high, then the system will switch. Release is not due to mutual inhibition, uh, because mutual inhibition has to do with the other population producing some negative feedback. And so that beta, this mutual inhibition parameter drops out. So the quartet and things like that are actually, um, are not going to be governed by mutual inhibition strength. So that was an interesting finding that we ended up getting. And so I'm going I'm to end this section by just saying that there's this complex relationship now between noise, off-state activity, and this fatigue variable. And there's a lot of kind of interesting analysis problems um, that we're trying to explore that are open, happy to, you know, other people want to uh, start looking into this. Um, I think there's some really fun, fun problems to work on there. Okay. The other thing is that this habituation effect, so I'm going to quickly just summarize this because I really want to actually um, talk about some other stuff as well. So it turns out that this model actually discriminates between synaptic depression and local fatigue. The habituation effect is actually due to um, the local fatigue. So if you see that in your system, it actually says that the, the primary type of fatigue is happening within the pool, not the connections between them. And the reason for that is that in the local fatigue, uh, I'm going to gloss over this because <laughs> I really want to get into some other stuff, but I, I'm just going to say that this intermittent rivalry is able to disambiguate um, this mechanism. And this is just pointing out again by what that rivalry can actually tell you a lot about the underlying system. Okay. So I'm actually going to speed through this last little section on theory because I want to get to the clinical section. And I'm going to say that there was a major flaw with all the modeling that we did prior to this because rivalry is actually fundamentally a stochastic phenomenon. And what we talked about so far are just deterministic models. And here's the cool thing about rivalry is that um, it has very char characteristic um, statistics. You've got this gamma distribution. Not only that, but it's extremely robust statistical parameters. So this is just showing across various forms of rivalry. And now you get this coefficient of variation around 0.6. Um, also over a very wide range of mean dominance times. Uh, you also have the skewness as well. And so this is a major feature of rivalry that you want to be able to capture. And so in order to figure out how to model this, what the stochastic model is for this, we actually went backwards in description, back to the neurons, and um, wanted to see if, if this popular model of spike variability actually explains the perceptual variability. And so we ended up um, looking at the balanced state system. And I am going to breeze really quickly through this um, and just show you mainly the results. I had, a, I had a, a great, so Benjamin Cohen worked on this. He was a postgraduate, um, post-college, post-baccalaureate uh, fellow that we had. And I posed this problem to him. I said, well, rivalry really depends on mutual inhibition, but the popular model for variability in the brain is balanced state, where excitation and inhibition are canceling each other out. So is there a common model, a self-consistent model, um, that does both? And so we explored that. And the answer, he looked at various forms of the model. And the answer is yes, you can actually get a self-consistent model. So this is just a system. It has all the spike statistics. So you have irregular spiking. Neurons tend to be asynchronous. Sorry, these black lines are empirical bounds. And the, the colored are what we get from our simulation. And so it's well within the empirical bounds. Rivalry as well. Um, these are the empirical bounds for the variability. Uh, it gets, captures that. It gets the gamma distribution. This black that's superimposed is actually from just a paper, experimental paper that was published. So showing that you know, there's some, some correspondence as well. It gets the mean statistics. And I'm actually going to quickly, sorry, i got to run through this. Um, this is really cool stuff. So one of the great things about uh, the balanced state is it actually reduces a nonlinear system down to a linear problem. And, um, and, we can build, and we can actually compare the balanced state theory to, um, to our simulations. And by the way, I also need to just throw out the name. Of course, balanced state theory was, some, it was great theory that was owned by Von Vries and Sompolinsky. I just need to make sure I give credit. Um, I'm going to skip through these slides. <laughs> what I'm going to tell you is that essentially what, what happens during rivalry is that it, it's, it's, it's kind of breaking balance. It's, it's both a balanced state and it's also not a balanced state. What ends up happening is the dominant pool is in a balanced state. But the suppressed pool is not. It actually um, is far from balanced. But it also looks noisy because it's being driven by the on state. 
What this tells us for coming up with the stochastic model is that there's some kind of cross multiplicative noise. That's the stuff that, that is the stochastic model that we're after. And so that's what we're doing. Um, what we're doing now is now coming up with a reduced model that's, that's consistent with this more complicated neuron model. Okay. So, okay, I got like five minutes. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna um, fortunately, so I am, my, my interest is clinical. So I dive deep into theory and want to gain a lot of confidence about what kind of modeling system I want to use. And I've been, you know, continuing doing theory experiment, uh, theory, theoretical work, but I'm really um, now moving back into the clinic. And, um, and I, want to, I want to be able to fit this model. So the thing about rivalry is that it's been experimented uh, in lots of clinical studies over the years. It's been associated with pretty much all major mental disorders, lots of pharmaceutical, uh, pharmacological interventions. The issue with all these experiments is that um, because of the task design, uh, there's really very little that we can say interpret them um, and have very little utility. And the reason for this, and this is actually an issue that I had for quite a long time, is that cognitive studies tend to be point analyses. Uh, and as we know, this is a problem, is that you can't get anything, you can't say anything about these curves um, if you're, all you're doing is you're looking at points. There's lots of other complicated things about cognitive studies as well. These are differential systems, um, they're time-varying systems, and so a lot of times these cognitive tests do not, um, do not account for this. But the fact that we have a mechanistic model uh, means that we can actually design better experiments. And so whether you use the model I'm interested in, this experiment I'm talking about, um, I'm really trying to hope that people will start doing, uh, redesigning these experiments. Okay, so what I'm working on these days is actually machine learning. And I just want to point out some important attributes. So if we have a differential system, uh, equation system, a, a time-varying system, uh, it looks different depending on the context, right, that we probe it. And that's important to point out. Um, I can really explain all that. But just to give an example of this, let's take, this is the ODE system that we're interested in for, that we're saying is our canonical system, let's say. So for rivalry, um, you can take a lot of the uh, understanding mechanisms and what it turns into is a different function. And it's important to know that it turns into this different function and how the parameters relate within that function. Uh, because if we just fit rivalry, we're just gonna fit this thing, we're not gonna actually fit our ODE system. So, you know, that's where the math comes in, is being able to translate back and forth between here. Uh, the other thing that we can do is, once we have some, some expressions, we can come up with some theoretical ideas of how identifiable the system is. And I'm just gonna throw out there, um, you know, it's theoretically you can identify 14 parameters in this, in rivalry. Um, the other nice thing about doing machine learning on this is that since this is a general model, you don't need to just use rivalry data. You can actually augment the system using um, other types of tasks. So you can do flash suppression. Uh, you can do um, winner take all. You can put all that data in and try to fit the same ODE system. So this is the rig that we're doing. This is what we set up. So we're using a smartphone app. Um, we use a VR rig. And right now we're doing self-report, but we're also looking at coupling that with EEG, getting some promising things with that. Um, the other thing too, um, so personally, I think automatic differentiation is a really magical, awesome um, computational tool. But whenever you can write down the gradients explicitly, it's way faster. Um, and so by having mathematical insight about the system, you can actually write down your gradients explicitly and come up with a pretty fast algorithm. Um, we have tons of work to do in terms of machine learning. But this is kind of like data off the system. Uh, you can fit it. So just some proof of concept. <laughs> Um, I got two minutes. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry, I'm breezing through all this. Um, so, how do you use this model? Okay. I think it's really important. So, I want to apply this to the clinic. Um, the thing is, is that uh, the things we're interested in bipolar disorder, things that sort, their, their, their time constants are way longer than what I'm modeling, right? So, the way that I imagine this is that I have some effective parameters I think describe cognition or a tr uh, class of cognitive traits really well. And I imagine that these are actually my latent variables. These are the things that are gonna describe who you are right now. Um, and what I wanna do then is fit that and track people over time in order to get these longer trajectories, see what that looks like. Uh, the other thing is, so I'm thinking that I have some kind of hierarchical system and somehow these are all mapping into these effective models. And what I'm showing here is that there's a lot of, I call these things islands, 
is that we can do really good modeling within certain areas and then bridging to these latent variables is still an open question. And so what I want to do is I want to do manipulations of these low levels, fit the parameters in a kind of backwards modeling um, some of these connections. So that's something I'm looking into. Like I said, tracking, uh, trying to get an idea of what these longer term trajectories are using these latent variables. Um, that's something I'm after. And then acknowledgments. <laughs> so a lot of this work I did with uh, Carson Chow, continue to do with him. Ben Cohen's the one who did a lot of the, the hard work on the balanced state kind of modeling. Uh, and then some other um, really good postdoc fellows. And on the experimental side, um, a lot of input for the quartet and things like that from Alex Martin, Steve Gotts, and consultation, David Leepold, Christopher Baker. All right, thank you.